Remakes of video games have become more and more common over the years, and if you've watched our documentaries on Demon's Souls Remake or Command & Conquer Remastered Collection, you know that even a seemingly simple do-over can involve a lot of challenging work. But what if your goal wasn't to remake a game, but to demake it? To create a version of a modern game that looks like it came from a previous era in game design? When we stumbled upon the story of Bloodborne PSX, a demake that was attempting to make a version of Bloodborne that looked and played like a classic PlayStation 1 title, like many of you, we were fascinated. Not only because of the incredibly unique design questions that a project like this raises, but also because, try as we may, from Software is not the type of studio that allows strange crowdfunded video crews to come do documentaries on their games. So we were delighted when Lilith Walther was more than happy to meet us in Los Angeles to talk about the remarkable story of her project. From the redesign of Central Yarnum to remapping controls, how From Software AI works, and what it was like adding her own unique levels to this beloved Soulsborne classic. say in like 2016 there was a thread on NeoGAF about people making like Photoshop mockups and like fake renders of demakes. There was like a God of War 3 demake and a Uncharted 2 demake. Um, I think it was like a Bioshock one. I saw that and Bloodborne was and is my favorite game ever and I was like okay well that's you know I would love to give that a shot so I threw together a prototype in like 2017, in three weeks. Yeah, obviously the, I'm a game developer, right? So the logical conclusion was like, well, it should be playable, right? So I went ahead and did that with my friend Corwin Pritchard, who helped out with the textures at that time. I started the prototype in 2017 in the middle of working on my personal indie game called Arcus. And that was starting to get in the way of development, so I shelved it with the intention of restarting it after that project finished. Arcus is, it started out as like a mobile game. It's like a tower defense, wave defense fantasy game. Very much Zelda inspired. And that was like my first major project. That was five years of development. And it was mostly just because most of it was just, I didn't really know what I was doing at the time. I was still learning, but I'm really happy I was able to release it. Yeah, and I learned a lot from that project and everything you see in Bloodborne PSX is a direct result of the things I learned in Arcus. We got finished at the end of 2020, and then I took a week off. And then after that, in January 7th of 2021, I restarted development of Bloodborne PSX from the ground up with the exception of a few models. I think the Hunter model, I think the Werewolf model got ported over, and that was basically it, but all the code is new. I went to school briefly, but I would say I'm more primarily self-taught. Just UDK, before Unreal Engine 4, there was the Unreal Development Kit, which was where I started. Actually, if you go even further back, um, I guess you could say I, my game development started with Little Big Planet, specifically Little Big Planet 2 with the circuit board system where it's like, oh, there's like pre-made blocks of code that you put on a circuit board and connect together. And I booted up Unreal Engine, uh, the Unreal Development Kit, and there's a visual scripting tool called Kismet, which is putting down a bunch of pre-made blocks of code connected with lines. And I was like, oh, this, this makes sense. So I was able to transfer my skills over pretty easily. And uh, I just kept building them up from there. What did those early days of development look like? Was it a lot of, like you said, just building out systems, trying to get all this sort of mm -hmm. stuff to work? Yeah, together? a lot of kind of figuring out what Bloodborne PSX was. The initial art pass wasn't in until like a couple of months. So it was a lot of gray cubes and like blue cubes standing in for doors and ladders, you know, and weapons. And all we had was the old werewolf from the prototype with some really terrible animations. Yeah, I was running around a very basic level with some very basic textures, like, oh, here's a tiling dirt texture, and I pixelized it and threw it in, and that was kind of Bloodborne PSX for a couple months. The biggest thing was that it wasn't just 
Bloodborne, the original PS4 Bloodborne, with some graphics changes. I wanted to specifically change more core underlying systems and sensibilities from the era of a PlayStation 1 game, like the clunky UI or the key system. My favorite thing was rolling back quality of life features. So like you have loading screens all over the place and you can't transform your weapon mid-combat you through the pause menu, all that fun stuff. That was really fun figuring out. I also liked the keys. This is a hot take, but I think the key system is better. I think, I think we quality of life to all the fun away from key systems. When you pick up a red card key in Doom, you're like, heck yeah. And you're gonna go to all the, you know, you just giddily run to all the red key doors. And you know, like in Zelda, you pick up a key and you're like, awesome. And like, and like, I couldn't tell you how many times in a Souls game, I opened up a door that was locked and I was like, I didn't even know where I got that key from. Because it's just automatically used, right? There is some fun to clunky design that can get sanded away when you improve the quality of life of a game. So it was really fun bringing, yeah, bringing some of that old design back to kind of show people like, hey, sometimes, you know, things were better in different ways in older games. People have the assumption that every aspect of video games gets better with every generation release. And that's just not true. Things go away and sometimes things get worse. Sometimes things don't change. It was really fun bringing back a lot of old things that I think were genuinely better than what they are like now. And um, couch co-op is probably the biggest example of that, but there's a bunch of other small things. Making something specifically with the words PSX in the title took a lot of pressure off and kind of made it like, kind of like how some people would say that making pixel art is easier than like painting, right? Um, I would say making a PlayStation 1 game, not just the art, but even the code was a little bit easier, not a lot easier, but it did take the pressure off a lot. So it was based off of the original PlayStation controller with no joysticks that removed most of the important functions, the lock-on and the camera control and movement, because you can't move with the D-pad on Bloodborne PS4. A D-pad is important shortcut stuff. That basically was the start of it. I had to move with the D-pad, which means all the D-pad stuff had to be removed. And I had to lock on with the X button. Also had to double as the interact button. Quick items and blood vials were two different buttons, uh, square and triangle, I think and that all got consolidated into one button. And also, um, the camera control was on L2 and R2, um, which meant that heavy attacks and the weapon transformation had to be removed because L1 became gun and R1 became just your attack button, which did light attacks, heavy attacks, and charge attacks. There was now three functions on a single button. That is the core system of how Bloodborne PSX worked and everything kind of revolved around that. It took a lot of time figuring out, but once I started doing the implementation, it kind of started falling into place, which I feel like is true for a lot of game projects, you know, impossibly huge code bases that you can't keep all in your head at once. It will kind of start going in a direction, um, almost kind of by itself, and you're more just trying to guide it the right way, if that makes sense. I can see the direction it was going, and that started to, everything started to come together. The first level I made that got into the final game, the final release, was the courtyard outside of the clinic. That was where a lot of my testing was. And actually, fun fact, the skybox texture was a render from a screenshot from Bloodborne PS4 from the clinic courtyard. And the original idea was, oh, I'd have a different like skybox depending on the area, but that was, but like skybox textures are huge, specifically for a PS1 game. So I just used that for the rest of the game. And um, I eventually Photoshopped a clock tower face on one of the buildings. And that just became the clock, you know, the, you know, the, the green, the big green clock tower face. That's not, that's not actually the clock tower. I don't even know what building that is. It's just a random building. <laughs> Outside of the change in the controls, like the button layouts, that was, mostly a one-to-one -one attempt at a recreation. I mean, I just recorded playthroughs of weapons and enemies and 
got the frame counts down and recreated them all in Blender with my PSXified characters that were made from scratch. As well as like damage calculation and stat progression, all that stuff was really fun figuring out, you know, kind of like deconstructing the game. There was a very invaluable video on YouTube where someone like hacked like a billion echoes and like leveled everything up in one go um, to 99. And I, I, just, I just watched it and I just, you can see how the stats grow and I was able to like recreate um, the, the growth curves and stuff. I have them all, I had them all mapped out at one point. So it was really fun to recreate. The first pass was an attempt at a perfect recreation. And then after all that was done, I did like a normal balancing pass without any outside influence. I just balanced it as I would balance a normal video game. That's kind of where it started to get its own identity. Cause it's not, like I said, it's not a perfect recreation. It was primarily the wikis. There's a couple of Bloodborne wikis and they're not all entirely accurate. Like some of the wikis have conflicting information on the same like topic, but it was primarily the wikis uh, specifically for how damage calculation was calculated. Grabbing that formula was really important. And I think, yeah, that was recreated one to one. I actually just remembered the dodging animations are one of the original animations from the prototype in 2017 that I grabbed as well. And the like running strafe, because you have to animate eight run cycles for, for each strafe. And my, my Achilles heel when it comes to animation is run cycles, I'm really bad at them. So <laughs> I recreated the run forward and then I just used the old ones for the rest. Enemy AI is, in terms of the broad spectrum of game development, that's probably the thing I'm the worst at. Um, and it's really, a nice little coincidence that Bloodborne AI is impossibly simplistic. All of the mind games you get from fighting a Souls enemy, a Soulsborn enemy, is the animation, um, which is one of my strong suits. So that really kind of fell into place. When it comes to the core raw AI of the Souls enemy, they kind of just run up to you and then play their animations. But, you know, they're impossibly, impeccably animated animations, but they're still just selecting animation from the list depending on your location and direction, right? So they're like, oh, there's an enemy directly behind me. I'll play my impossibly impeccably animated attack behind me attack, right? Um, but the AI is extremely simple. Um, there is one little trick that I really enjoyed is that if an enemy runs into a destructible object, they'll be forced to play an attack animation. Um, so they'll run up and go like, oh, there's a, there's a thing in my way and they'll keep running and it, like, it feels like they're really smart, but that is actually a very simple little interaction. It feels like a really natural, like smart little AI interaction. It's, it's such a good little trick. I think that's my favoriteest thing in demaking Bloodborne, really diving impossibly deep into every aspect of that game and just making a whole bunch of discoveries that I never would have noticed otherwise. And it just really deepened my appreciation. I was obviously a really big Bloodborne fan, but and I did think it was the best game of all time, and I still do, but I just have more appreciation for it now. Earlier I mentioned replicating sensibilities of games made during the PS1 era, because it's not just the hardware, it's the mindset of culture, right? If, if you gave a modern developer a development kit for a PlayStation 1 game and told them to make an indie game with it, and it was authentically a PS1 game, it would be fundamentally different from a PS1 game. You'd throw it into the library of PS1 games, it would stand out. The biggest example of that is the like, holy shit, we're in 3D now mindset, where every game would just shove a big 3D object in your face and like rotate it around super slowly. Every game did that and it was great, I loved it. Tomb Raider was a big inspiration, specifically like the radial wheel of the 3D objects. That was definitely Tomb Raider inspired. That stopped as we got used to 3D. It wasn't, it wasn't eye popping anymore. It was great bringing that back. One of the big things was like how animation is handled in old games. They're a little more basic and rudimentary, which was really fun to try and figure out. There's also limitations with the PlayStation 1 that affected how animation worked. The, you know, infamous vertex jitter, the wobble, the, the melting polygons, that is dependent on the camera, like the camera thrust and the angle of the camera. If the camera and the thing that the camera is looking at are both still, you will not get any deformations of the model. So a lot of 
characters would stand perfectly still when they're idling. That was one thing I noticed and would only move when they have to. So if they're just like leaning up against a wall, they would be statue still. And then like they'd rotate their head to look at something and it would just like rotate and then it would be perfectly still again. And at first I thought that was just some weird animation limitation, but now that I've gone through the process, I'm pretty certain it was to combat the vertex jitter. That was a really fun thing to figure out. Oh, don't you worry. Whatever happens, you may think it all a mere bad dream. In some instances, there were some things that I took some creative liberties with. I prioritized the Bloodborne combat feel, the Souls combat feel. Like I said, Souls games are extremely animation focused. If your animation is bad, you have a bad playing game, which is not true for every game, but for some super in-depth action RPG hybrid game, which is what the Souls games are, animation was really important. So for combat animations, I tried to emulate as best I could with a little bit less polish, but still getting the timing perfect and everything. But for like cutscene animations and stuff, it was pretty fun trying to translate that to work into a PS1 cutscene. So in terms of combat, it was mostly one-to-one, -one, but in terms of the limitations, I really loved pulling in the draw distance with the, with the black distance fog, right? That was really fun and that, that also required a lot of changes in the level design. It is kind of an iconic Souls thing to see something 10 miles away and then, you know, a lot, a little bit or a lot later, you see it, um, like you're, you're there, right? So it was really fun trying to find ways to bake landmarks into the skybox or something, like a secondary skybox so you can place it. The biggest example is the bridge that the cleric beast is in. You know, when you're climbing the ladder, you can hear the screen and then you look to the left and there's the bridge. I made a 2D texture of the bridge, almost like a black silhouette, because um, the game fades to black, so the skybox has to kind of be black with a simple sky. So I made a silhouette of the bridge, and so you could see it when you look to the left, and it would be unloaded in other levels, so you wouldn't see it. Was there any areas in particular that you enjoyed developing, or that like, you know, when you step back from them, you were like, oh, we like nailed the feel of this. Father Gascoigne. Oh, yeah? yeah, absolutely. That was the best part of the game. <laughs> tell, tell us more. I would say his like his exhale shot into the camera. That is the most iconic part of Bloodborne. At least when I think of Bloodborne, I think of that shot. That was the thing I was most excited for was recreating Father Gascoigne, specifically that shot. I actually made three mouth textures just for that shot um, because his, his, face, his mouth is a texture, right? There's no like model mouth. So um, of him like opening his mouth and they were drawn to perspective, which was inspired by Mega Man Legends. They love drawing their mouths to perspective to the camera. You know, like a fake depth with a very low poly count and texture count. So I did that. That was incredible. I really enjoyed that. And all the animations as well, Father Gascoigne, is like three bosses worth of animations. He has three different phases, and one of which is just a completely different character. Like, you know, like he's like Beast Gascoigne, a completely different moveset. And it was a lot of work, but I'm really happy that I was able to recreate that as authentically as you could with the PlayStation 1 remake. That was the best part of the game, in my opinion. <laughs> it starts with a research pass. I just play the game a lot, record it um, with a capture card, and study the character, or the, the fight, I guess. From there, I would grab specific video clips of the animations, you know, clip them down. So this is an 11 frame, not 11, like a 20 something frame animation. I would clip it down to that exactly, and that would be my reference. When, when I animated the model in Blender, I wouldn't say, I didn't rotoscope it, but I definitely had the video up, like imported into Blender of the animation and I would look at it as I animated it so I can go through the frames and make sure it was perfect. It was going to end at the Cathedral Ward and it was going to end with Vicar Amelia. But yeah, I ended up cutting it because the Cathedral Ward is even bigger than 
central Yarnum, and like 90% of all the uh, NPC interactions are in the Cathedral Ward. The Cathedral Ward is kind of like the main hub where all the levels spoke out of, so that really increased the complexity. So I decided to cut that, and I had some time left over. Making just central Yarnum was too small in scope, so I decided to kind of turn central Yarnum into a, for lack of a better term, a big like backtrack to get back to the start where you would fight a, an original boss in a Resident Evil inspired mansion, um, reusing a lot of assets. There, I reused the Yarnum interior to make a new level, a very short one, but that was really fun. That side of things, like making new content, kind of grew the drive to do that as I worked on the project. One of the main reasons was just Bloodborne PSX as a fan project, as a remake or a demake of a game, comes with a lot of limitations creatively. That was something that I kind of struggled with for a while. I'm a very you know creative person. I like making all these crazy weird things. That kind of started with that and also the excuse of like there's a lot of parts in Central Yarnum that are very unique but also like one minute long. There's a house that's really dark that you need to use your torch. It's one room. There is an entire sewer system that's like three rooms. So I decided to take those and extend them to justify creating a bunch of unique assets for them. And then with what I explained earlier, I wanted to make something a whole new original level with the assets that I made already and a few other things. I tend to make new content on like a needs basis. So there were some things I needed to do to justify some of the things that I created. I only had two keys in the game, I think. So I wanted to make some more keys and I wanted to introduce an enemy to stalk you throughout Central Yarnum, a, a nemesis, basically we can call it a nemesis. And um, so I was like, okay, a bunch of keys, we're using a house interior level and there's a nemesis running around, like that's a Resident Evil level. So I might as well lean into that, so. <laughs> I did not want you to beat Gascoigne and then just said demake over goodbye. That would be boring and disappointing and it wasn't an ending. It was a cliffhanger that would never get continued. I wanted to properly end the game and I wanted to end it on an emotional high note. And I could not make any new assets for new levels because I didn't have time. What I landed on was you did Sunshine Yarnum again, but backwards and everything was harder. One of two of my biggest additions was adding in an invincible enemy that would chase you throughout Central Yarnum. And that would be what made the backtracking interesting. The biggest thing was that this thing could chase you through loading screens, which was never a thing in the rest of Bloodborne PSX. So it's a unique function to this one enemy. That was the biggest thing. I felt like that was a really good layer to add on top of the original Soulsborne loop of you go through a level, you unlock the shortcuts, you come back later at some point with the shortcuts unlocked. That was something that never happened in Bloodborne PSX if you just stopped the gas going, so I wanted to go through it again to make use of the unlock shortcuts. And having an invincible enemy hanging out meant that you had to really plan your route through this level that you just went through, through this maze that you just went through, and unlocked a bunch of shortcuts for. I felt like that really challenged the player's internal map of the area, and that just felt like a really good way of expanding, you know, the Souls formula. Um, originally, the Winter Lantern I took from the late game of Bloodborne. Quick aside, the Winter Lantern enemy is one of the best enemy designs ever, and they used Bloodborne PS4 uses it like three times, and I was like, you know, this enemy deserves better. So, <laughs> what, what, what better? Uh, use for you know turning him into a nemesis that was that was really fun and I made a basement level an extended basement level um, which went into the weird experiments that you find in the mensis level um, like oh you find like dog crows and stuff and that's where the winter lanterns are so I made a very brief little lore explanation for like oh these experiments are being made in Yarnum or whatever because there's a bunch of dogs in cages you can kind of like get the implication, but I'm getting off topic. Anyways. Um, <laughs> it's all good though, so it doesn't matter. <laughs> that was the first part, was the nemesis going around and chasing you throughout Central Yarnum as you went back to the start to Gilbert's estate. That was 
my original idea for the ending. You fast track the Gilbert side quest where he gets sicker and sicker and turns into a beast and you have to kill him and it's sad. I felt like that wasn't good enough to end the game on, so I kind of fast tracked that and then turned Gilbert's beast form from a random enemy into a unique boss. You had to enter his house, which was never enterable in the PS4 version. I needed to, to add a couple more keys to justify the key system I built. And I can only reuse existing world assets like the yarn interior, which didn't get a lot of use. So I was like, okay, a big house and a bunch of keys and a nemesis. Like that's a, that's a Resident Evil level. I might as well lean into that. This game is pretty survival horror -y enough. So the final boss, secret final boss, which was Gilbert turned into a beast. That was a very big moment for me. It was kind of, I guess you would say like, the end goal for this demake, which was take everything I learned, every single thing, all the PS1 stuff, all the Bloodborne stuff, and make something new, make a new boss. That was the end point for everything I learned. I made that at the very end. It was made in two weeks, um, the actual encounter and the level that he was in. Very intense two weeks, but coming up with a whole new moveset and there were a lot of limitations I had to work around. The design of Beast Gilbert is a combination of Father Gascoigne's Beast Rig, um, his like proportions and his like animation set, which I did eventually change. And his 3D model is a werewolf and the starter garb smashed together with the proportions changed to fit Beast Gascoigne's rig. And then I did a final art pass to make it look cohesive. that sped it up considerably because I had a very short window to make this boss fight. And I would say the vast majority of it was the animation set. We had two bosses beforehand. We had a giant big cleric beast and then we had the like smaller but still pretty slow and heavy hitting Father Gascoigne. So I wanted to make a normal sized fast boss. That was how I landed at this type of thing and I just took that and went with it. The boss fight starts with Gilbert strapped to an operating table and you just hit him while he's on the operating table and he breaks out. That was in my head for like six months while I was making the rest of Bloodborne PSX. That was really how I wanted to like push it, make the end the game on an emotional high note like I mentioned before and really get players, you know, to really feel for one of these bosses. That's pretty, it's a pretty standard like final boss Souls game final boss encounter is like, oh, you know, oh, I just, you know, it's, it's someone I know, or it's personal, or it's sad, or, you know, you get the sad piano, or whatever. It's not, it's not a Souls game until you fight some old guy while sad piano plays, right? <laughs> um, so yeah, that was where we landed. Um, and once again, Evelyn Lark did an incredible job on that boss music, which was a new composition. The first thing I animated when I created that rig and that character, because you kind of have to figure out characters, or at least how I figure out characters, is I do some test animations with them. And the first thing I animated, which made it into the final move set, was the grab. And it's kind of a gimmick, I guess. He doesn't hurt you. Um, he grabs you and throws you up into the air, and then he drops you and like clutches his head and falls over. And it's kind of like, oh, like Gilbert's still in there, you know, and you still have to fight him because he's trying to kill you. And that's like the objective. And it's like sad and all that fun stuff. And it was really fun building that up throughout the Resident Evil mansion that I made, which is Gilbert's estate. You know, there's some very classic Resident Evil style, like lore pages that you can stumble into and read about. And the first one you read is basically him asking you to kill him <laughs> because he's turned into a beast. It's very like tropey, pretty like standard type of story, but it was really fun writing it and implementing it in a, in a way that felt very soulsy. Um, the type of game I make is not very traditionally soulsy. I tend to make more like fast paced action games. So, or at least that's the type of game that I would like to make and what I will be, be making after Bloodborne Cart. Um, <laughs> but yeah, it was really fun building that fight out in a way that felt like a Souls game 
and operated within the box that people expect a Souls game to operate within. There was some cut content. There was a cut phase in the boss, the third phase, um, where he's like scared and running away from you. I think that's another example of like you can cut something and the final result is better. The original plan was he'd be all scared, he'd be running away from you in the final phase, and like, you know, he'd kill him and it'd be a very like elaborate animated death animation. What I eventually did was do a very small but very like intimate death animation where it just cuts the music. There's no ending. There's hardly any VO, very simple VO, and he kind of just like stands there and stares at you and falls over. And it felt very like intimidating and a little bit creepy. Um, it was really fun leaning into the creepiness of Bloodborne. I really enjoyed how that entire boss fight went, but specifically how it ended and with the ending cutscene focusing on the clock tower, which was present in the entire game and you hear it in both versions, in the PS4 and the PS1 version. It was really nice to kind of turn it into a focal point for the ending of the game and also a focal point for the secret ending of the game if you get all the insight, which was another really fun thing to recreate that was in Bloodborne PS4 and I made a simpler version in the PS1 version. It was really, really fun making a whole new level with a new boss at the end. Within the limitations that I had, within the time limitations and the asset creation limitations that I had, and I'm really happy that the entire Bloodborne PSX team really came together and made a really memorable ending for this little demake that we made. I was actually pretty proud of myself for not crunching. Um, I mean, I was like stressed out because like it's a, it was my biggest project. It, you know, hyper exploded um, on Twitter when I posted the, uh, and YouTube, when I posted the Claire Beast boss fight. Nah, it's like over a million views now, holy shit. So there was a lot of pressure, but I wasn't burning myself out. I wasn't working, you know, more than eight hours a day. It was nice to understand that I could cut out parts of the game instead of crunching and the game would not be worse. Like I said, I was going to add the Cathedral Ward and I cut it and that's like half of the game. And that doesn't mean the game is half as good. I would argue that it's better because I was able to focus more on Central Yarnum as a level, as, as a game world, I guess, in this context. I was pretty stressed out, but I was confident in the game I made. I, you know, it was, it was good. Um, I feel like I, I was, yeah, I was confident that I made a pretty decent game and I feel like people would enjoy it. And they really did. And that was really nice. Yeah, I really loved the reception. Specifically, you know, watching the streams, seeing everyone react to the extra content added to the end with the Winter Lantern. I'm specifically really proud of what happens immediately after Gascoigne, where the players slowly figure out like, oh, all the lanterns are turned off. Why is, why are all the enemies dead? Why is, why is this creepy singing happening? What's going on here? And like, you know, the Souls veterans who've encountered Winter Lantern before would be like, um, when they heard it and the newcomers would be like, why is there singing? You know, and they turn a corner and like and grab them and you know, they die, it was great. That was, that was like my favorite of the new content. I think that was exactly how I imagined it in my head, like building the intrigue. And then you see the Winter Lantern and you know, it walks down the stairs in the green light and you're hiding behind a random boulder and it slowly comes around and grabs you. That was, that was, that was really fun. I was really proud of that. Just in general, what, what's it been like for you being out there so much and having people interacting with you around this project? It's honestly like kind of fun. Um, I've, you know, there is a lot of hate online, um, but I guess you could say I'm pretty good at just letting that roll off of me, um, which sucks that I have to have a skill to do that. But um, it does mean that I can, yeah, I can kind of just let that stuff roll off of me. And what's left is just all the kind people leaving really nice comments and telling me how much they enjoyed watching the development. Because for people who don't know, I posted development threads every day on Twitter, every day, except for Sunday. And because I don't crunch. Yeah, and people just following along, you know, asking questions like, oh, how did you do this? And I would go in detail and it was really fun because there's a lot of people who follow me who aren't game developers and it was, you know, they're still capable of following along. One of the biggest things I dislike about game development is how opaque it is and how secretive it is because, you know, it's like a, it's a huge industry with like 
big events and surprise reveals and stuff. So it all has to be very secret, like super intense NDAs and like blacklisting potentially. So like, it was really great kind of just being 100% transparent except for the secret Winter Lantern content and the secret final boss. Yeah, that was, that was really great. It was really nice. Um, I am gonna be releasing the code base at some point in the future. So anyone can make whatever the hell they want because it's the free project. Like I'm not making money off of it. There is no point in like hoarding the code base to myself just because that's how everyone else does it. Like, yeah, sure. Like just give it out, have people make whatever they want. If someone wants to finish it, like I'm not gonna stop you. I, I, I don't recommend it, but like you could try. Like <laughs> based purely off of boss numbers, I made 9% of Bloodborne. Um, so if you wanna make the other 91%, go ahead. Aha. <laughs> uh -huh. You must be the new hunter. The threat of a takedown was definitely something that hangs over every fan project. That always hung over me. Um, and I was kind of, I planned for it. Like I was like mentally preparing myself for if this got taken down, you know, I gotta figure out how to deal with that, you know? And I felt like I was at a pretty good place. Like if it got taken down, it wouldn't have like devastated me, um, but it didn't, miraculously. There were some people who contacted me like, oh, we would love to put Love from PSX in our little indie show or whatever. I'm like, I can't, like, I don't wanna risk it, you know? <laughs> like, I always felt like if, we, if Bloodborne PSX, even if it was acknowledged as a free fan game, if it was put up next to like products, it would be considered like a step too far that might encourage it. So like it, yeah, there were, there was a few things that I decided against uh, there are a few decisions I made about, like, I guess you would say marketing Bloodborne PSX that I decided not to do, um, specifically due to its fan game nature. Yeah. But I'm very happy that I was able to release it. <laughs> For one, I learned a heck of a lot. I have never learned as much about game development in the 13 month period than when I was making Bloodborne PSX. Um, that will directly influenced my games in the future, just like how Arcus directly influenced the creation of Bloodborne PSX. I didn't make any money off of it. I mean, you know, I have, I have a donation tip jar. I mean, I made, a, you know, a little bit off of that, but that was fine. It was made part-time. I have a job at an indie studio called Heartstrings. They're making a turn-based RPG called Witch. I'm building the code base for that. They were in development at the same time. So you might just, if you are familiar with Bloodborne PSX, you might see some similarities in the code base because, you know, just, there are things I learned making Witch that I put into Bloodborne PSX, and there are things I learned in Bloodborne PSX that I put back into Witch. It was very cyclical, very fascinating. Um, one of the big ones was inventory. Uh, as, as a turn-based RPG, you pick up a lot of items with item descriptions, and, you know, the same for a Souls game. So a lot of those things were very, very similarly designed. Do you have another personal project or are you happy to, well, actually, now that I think of it, it's the next question. Let's just talk about Bloodborne Cart. I'm guessing, <laughs> sure. that's, I'm guessing that's the next thing. Yeah, Bloodborne Cart. Um, that was very fun to announce, I guess you'd say with my little announcement on Twitter and YouTube. Bloodborne Cart has been a meme for a very long time. I don't know if you know the origin of it, but it was a fake leak that someone made to demonstrate how easy it is to fake a leak because Bloodborne 2 gets thrown in the rumor mill like every five weeks, it seems like. If I remember correctly, if I remember this lore correctly, it was, that was how it was created. There was two fake screenshots. One was a carriage ride from Assassin's Creed Syndicate with some like Bloodborne UI thrown on top of it and for April Fools, in the middle of Bloodborne development, I made a joke post and me and Evelyn made a quick little playable, kind of playable. Imagine like a smoke and mirrors E3 demo as like half playable, but like not really. So we, we, made, we made a Bloodborne cart level and that got the most views out of anything Bloodborne PSX related I've made outside of that Cleric Beast boss fight video. And I was like, oh, like that's, People actually want that. And so I promised I would release that prototype. Oh, I would, or that, I guess you call it like a game jam game. Like you made it in a couple days. A vertical slice. A vertical slice, <laughs> yeah. I would polish it up and release that. It kind of grew from there. I 
looked at the code. It was very bad and janky and hastily put together. And I was like, I'll improve this. And just, you know, one thing led to another. I'll make a new cart, I'll make new enemies, make new tracks. And, and then Evelyn started making incredible Bloodborne cart music. The Thumerian Cup, that was the name of the track. Um, and we have, yeah, I got the Odin underpass and the, and the, yeah, the Central Yarnum Roadway. And it's, just, it's just so fun. It just, it, just, it just makes itself. It is just so fun making Bloodborne cart that I just wanted to keep going. So that's kind of, I mean, it's not gonna be as big as Bloodborne PSX. It'll probably be like an hour long with a couple tracks and a couple like racers, but. Once you're done with Bloodborne cart, then no more DMAX? No more DMAX. <laughs> I, I'm already getting comments like, oh, you should demake this game and this game and Elden Ring and all that stuff. No more DMAX. I'm done. I want to get back into making a bunch of fun original stuff. Yeah, it sounds like you have an idea of what you want to do. Mm -hmm. It's going to be a cyberpunk character action game. We look forward to interviewing you again in a few <laughs> years then. We'll see if, if it blows up. <laughs>